Avalon, led by Alariel the Radiant, are a high elf faction whose power is no secret, as they are consistently held in high regard. When Avalon first dropped, they dominated all the high elf factions, including Etain, due to the old chaos invasion, a lack of new factions, and basically no Ulfhorn civil wars. So today, friends, with the final DLC dropped, we're gonna dig in and see how Alariel and her faction stack up, and if she is still worthy of the title, Ever Queen. To break down the faction, we're going to assess its performance under five different categories, discuss the optimal tools and tactics, and then assign a 5 star rating to each category before arriving at a final percentage. This guide is based on my personal experiences in tandem with community feedback and playtesting of additional playstyles to ensure a balanced perspective. Welcome to Elven Plot Armor, and this is the faction focus for Avalon. Starting off with strategy, that is the ability to control the grand campaign and tools available to manipulate the campaign map. The high elf race consists of convenient building lines, leading to easy access of units and heroes that help control the campaign map, and it's nearly impossible for them to raid badly here. Influence allows them to stop confederations and control interactions, and the Avalon faction gets a 25% discount on all intrigue at the court actions. A small bonus, but one worth mentioning. A frequently overlooked strength of Avalon is their plus two starting capacity to handmaidens, meaning you'll have access to three handmaidens straight out the gate to either buff your army with the resistant or hone traits, or skyrocket your development with the Entrepreneur or for Kun traits, which also stack with their Stimulate Growth ability. Handmaidens will also grow and gain buffs such as level 16's Favorite of Isha, giving a global plus one to public order, meaning that your army of Handmaidens late game will be able to calm a relatively new conquest from the other side of the map. Possibly their biggest strength is one that you won't see too much benefit from early in the campaign, is the Handmaidens Gallery, which allows Sisters of Avalon to be recruited, but more importantly, increases your Handmaiden cap by 1 at tier 3 instead of the regular Woodlines tier 4 building. Now while you might initially think that you're going to spam a Handmaidens Gallery at every minor settlement, the truth is is that you need to prioritise your tradables and income above this so there will be provinces where you only have this building in your capital, but that's not the point. The point is is that you can build this building straight away, not have to develop a level 2 settlement up, and while getting to tier 4 takes a very long time, getting to tier 3 definitely does not, and then these Handmaidens can be reassigned to new settlements where they can skyrocket those developments as well. You're probably starting to notice the theme of nature and growth is one very intertwined with the Avalon faction. Now we move to the more divisive part of Avalon, and that is the faction's link to Ulthorn and its purity. While veterans won't have much trouble here, if Ulthorn loses control as so much of a single settlement, you will incur negative effects which will start to snowball as you lose more provinces. This can be as simple as a revolt or a sneaky dark elf faction coming in and snagging a territory from you. This honestly never used to be a real problem for Avalon because they never really lost any settlements, but now there is a much more aggressive Marathi and the minor High Elf factions love to civil war with each other, as well as Avalon are the only High Elf faction having to deal with the Blood Voyages from the north. Now while all of these aren't necessarily going to end your campaign, they can definitely disrupt your hold on Ulf ones. So in summary, the additional content added to the game has certainly made Alariel's early game far more challenging challenging and dynamic than comparatively to Tyrion's confederation romp, but these extra risks by the mid game stop serving as a double edged sword and basically work as a magnificent buff, essentially for free, bolstering growth public order and income of your entire faction. Now moving to the faction leader, the faction leader often has abilities that will bolster the strategy rating and I'm going to mention here much of Avalon's power is drawn from Alariel herself and I'm not going to penalize the faction for this but it's worth noting she is by far the easiest high elf lord to confederate and you can integrate most of Avalon into another faction. This is due to Alariel's most powerful ability, the power of nature. Anytime Alariel finishes her turn within the borders of a settlement you control, for the next subsequent 9 turns that settlement will get a buff to public order, growth and give you plus one influence every turn. And this can be applied to every settlement she steps inside, so getting her to do a tour of the provinces, ending each turn in a different settlement, is a fantastic way of not only skyrocketing growth, stabilizing your provinces, but it gives a valuable source of influence in the early game. Alariel herself also has a double-edged sword ability in that she gets weaker around chaos, although this penalty is relatively light and by the time chaos come, this should not really prove a huge issue to you or your faction. 
When leveling up Alariel, well, she's a caster so she must make the difficult choice of whether she gets Lightning Strike or continues down her spell line to get Banishment. On Legendary, I would always opt to get Lightning Strike first, then can go down the spell line, making sure you get Shield of Thorns, working your way to Banishment to finally deal that nice heavy Vortex damage. Be sure to throw her on her Eagle Mount, making her hard to kill and maneuverable, and then just put points in Bowmaster, working your way to Favored Winds to boost your Sisters of Avalon, and that takes us to the unique skill trees she has. She can choose Fire of Blood, which boosts her unique Tree Folk units, or she can increase Sisters of Avalon, which is honestly a much better option for her. The problem with Tree Folk is that they aren't Sisters of Avalon. Whilst these units can be useful and are unique to the Avalon faction, they just simply cost too much in the early game and then get eclipsed by the late game. Most importantly, the Sisters of Avalon line also grants you access to another two handmaidens, naturally giving the Avalon faction access to five handmaidens once you've got this line. More importantly, this gives you the ability to recruit handmaidens anywhere. Once you've maximized this tree, simply increase Alariel's defense ability and spellcasting abilities, as per your preferred playstyle. As for her unique rights, Alariel gets Invocation of Vault, get Siege Attacker, as well as Invocation of Assyrian, allowing her to stabilize her provinces even more. Her unique rights include the Invocation, well should I say improved Invocation of Isha, which only really buffs tree units, but it is still important for taking out Morath and avoiding attrition in her provinces. Her other unique right only increases her spellcasting ability which honestly I've never found comes in clutch and unfortunately this doesn't help accelerate the experience of powerful units like mages or nobles. Avalon is associated with growth in nature and that absolutely translates here giving her a strategy rating of 4.5 stars. Alariel herself is just an administrative powerhouse and she's the absolute queen of growing and nurturing an empire and while this doesn't sound flashy you will have stable problems that aren't revolting firing up to tier 5 in record time. While her start isn't as quick as Tyrion's confederation romp, she has the tools to shoot past him and almost any other lord by the mid game. The next category is geography, which reviews the defensibility of the start, the navigation of the surrounds, and your starting provinces. Avalon begins in a respectable three settlement province, which is incredibly well defended despite the increased aggression towards Ulthorn. While at first this position looks amazing, it does have the slight fallback that it is slightly cagey. To defeat your first enemy, the Scourge of Cain, you will have to venture up north past the gates, meaning you have more chance of running into Norskans or Dark Elf factions early, reducing your control over your engagements. But on the plus side, you have to go past gates. That's right, you have freaking gates. The problem with the gates that you do need to be aware of though, is unless the owner of the gate is hostile against an army crossing it, that army can go through completely unchallenged and they can come in and wreck your inner provinces while you're out trying to finish them off at the Shrine of Cain. So just be aware of that and try to get Illyrian on board to join your wars or whoever owns those gates, or better yet, get control of the gates yourself as soon as possible. Unlike Tyrion who is unlikely to be discovered by any factions he doesn't want, Alariel does have this challenge of being perched along the north and being closer to danger. Although I will note here a perfectly viable strategy is to venture out and sack the Scourge of Cain's settlements, weakening them so Kreis and Illyrian can snatch them up so they can build them up for you and you can confederate them at a later time. For geography, Avalon scores 4 and 3 quarter stars for having a well defended but not completely out of harm's way settlement that serves as a great starting base of operation. Next we have the diplomacy rating which assesses how hostile your starting area is, any friendly opportunities for alliances you have, and your overall ability to control your threats and engagements. Avalon start at war with the Scourge of Cain but you can expect backup from both Marathi and Crone Hellebron and while I do think that anti-player biases are largely exaggerated, there definitely exists one for Alariel. She gets targeted by Dark Elves like no other faction. I've literally had Dark Elf factions pass the fog of war undiscovered, who couldn't even join a war, declare war on me. And this applies for Nagarond, as well as the minor factions. You will almost certainly by turn 30 have Crone Hellebron declaring war on you, who is likely to be allied with Nagarond, meaning Malekith will also be coming for you at some point. This does limit Alariel's ability to control her faction's engagements and does need to be considered here. But let's look at the good. 
you have the ability to confederate only rivaled by Tyrion and potentially a Lithanar. I recommend trying to secure the east side by getting Safari and Devress under control, although you may want to also get Kalador to get eyes on Imric and bring him under your fold. Tyrion can be difficult to confederate, I have a guide if you'd like to see on how to get him around turn 20, or ally with him and get him later in the piece. And in terms of external factions, let's not forget the negative 25% to intrigue at the court allows you to transform enemies into friends much easier and develop trade routes, meaning the good tends to mostly outweigh the bad, giving Ilariel a nearly perfect 4 and 3 quarters stars. And that brings us to the military rating, which assesses the faction's ability to control and efficiently win military engagements. The high elf signature spearmen and archers will carry any faction to the middle game, and once your economy starts going well, the Sisters of Avalon will take control. So effectively, Ilariel's faction plays like any others. Throw 1 to 5 heroes at the front, a couple of silver and guard on the flanks to protect your sisters, and late game throw in some big monsters, and you've pretty much got yourself a high elf army that can handle most things. But Ilariel's unique ability is the tree folk units that can function as line holders and counter charges, but their hefty price tag and lack of a shield, which is bad because you're mostly fighting elves early, means that they're not well suited to your early game. However, don't disband the tree folk in your starting army because they have siege attacker, meaning you don't need to get a bolt thrower to siege capitals. Access to tier 3 Sisters of Avalon is convenient, but by the time your supply lines can afford multiple sister stacks, you will likely be at tier 4. So while this isn't devastating, it does give you strong units that you can raise to avert a crisis. For her unique quest items, it begins with the staff that allows her to get an increased recharge and extra winds of magic, so that is very welcome. The shield stone of Isha, providing some defensive buffs, and all you have to do is occupy the gate north of her starting province. To win this battle, simply sort your army out on the far right hand side, avoiding the front gate, shred the people on the walls, board the walls with your troops, and fire in. And her quest item is the Star of Avalon, which requires you to jump through a few hoops, but the most difficult one is having to defeat three Norsecan battles. So a great strategy is to keep Skeggy alive until Alariel hits level 15, but if that fails you can always sail to Albion where there will be a nearby Norsecan tribe for you to fight. I would recommend killing the Dark Elves before you focus on Norska. This battle is definitely one of the more difficult and the easiest way to do it is immediately put your troops in the back right corner putting them out of range of the artillery, who you can send Ilariel over to harass, and use a fire mage on a dragon's area of effect spells to take the enemy down. I've thrown in some cheap units to show this fight is certainly doable, but I would recommend a couple units of silver and guard and heroes necessary to hold the front line, and as many sisters of Avalon as you can afford. For overall military score, Ilariel's faction gets four and a quarter stars. The Hyles boast a lot of flexibility, and being able to have an army full of sisters with increased melee and 15% extra missile damage is certainly very welcome. However, Alariel does not give her faction any discounts to fielding more Sisters of Avalon, which limits how much she can gear this benefit in the early game. However, she still manages to hit such a high score despite the fact she can't summon mammoths out of thin air or anything too ridiculous, but she tends to win in the typical high elf faction and wins very well. Finally, to economy rating, which assesses the ability to generate wealth, cover costs, and expand your empire. And as you may have guessed, Alariel's faction is going to score very, very well here. Starting an Oth one means lots of tradables and an empire that grows quickly thanks to handmaidens and the typical high elf tropes. Functioning with a very strong high elf economy and the ability to expand it quickly allows Avalon to snowball its bank account rapidly and money soon becomes a non-issue. By the mid-game, Defender of Avalon purely works as a multiplier and compounds on the faction's already impressive civil administration. I've mentioned the high elf race mastery as well as Tyrion's guide all the ways to maximize income, so please consult those guides for the strategies to maximize these, but Avalon delivers all of these and then some to gain a perfect 5 stars in economy. Finally, the overall assessment. Itain and Avalon have very similar campaigns. Itain has the most comfortable start and can essentially take on the campaign under his own terms and quickly snowball, while Avalon has a bit more of a cagey start with mechanics that can bite her back but she has the tools to leap ahead of Tyrion by the mid-game. Since their debut, Avalon have had far more challenges in the form of new factions, aggressive Dark Elves and Ulthorn being at war with itself, but she still clocks in at a rocking 93%. 
This is coincidentally the same score as Tyrion's, and when assessing which one's better isn't quite as clear cut anymore, well, which faction is stronger? Is it Alariel's faction? Well, absolutely yes, but she does have more challenges, and that includes having to confederate Tyrion himself, as well as having less control over her initial campaign's engagements. So if someone asks me which one is better, my answer would be this. If you're playing only a short campaign victory or not even likely to finish, play Tyrion. If you want to play until the end of the Chaos Invasion, either works well. But if you're planning to go for long victory or paint the entire map, then Avalon is by far the better option because in terms of administration and expanding a large empire, Alariel is very much still the Ever Queen. And that's the end of this guide. Thank you guys so much for watching. Please consider subscribing to Elven Plot Armor for new guides every single week. This is Elven Plot Armor. Cheers for watching.